We're going to be talking tonight about the intersection of content and community and how that relates to tone and especially obviously now kind of the whole thesis of this talk is that we can't ignore what's happening in the world even though we may be working on corporate or other nonprofit sites that like the world exists and we have to acknowledge it that's at least my opinion um, I'm gonna take one minute and just tell you about Big Thinker Society it's kind of my pride and joy. I've been doing it for about five and a half years. As um, Paula said, we are a strategic consultancy. We focus on action-based strategies for today's conscious culture. And we're gonna talk about our conscious culture tonight. We really are in a place in society where we are um, more aware of the world, more connected than ever before. This is the kind of work we do. We do research and insights, marketing strategy, communications, every kind of communication you can think of from email to podcasts. And we do a lot of interaction design, um, visual design, product design. I put this up here because if you are a contractor um, and you're interested in speaking, uh, please reach out to me. I, I love meeting people. I love um, talking to folks who might be interested in working together. So that's an open invite uh, if you'd like to reach out and we'll schedule some time to talk. Um, sorry, I don't know what happened there. And I'll share one more thing here, which is our anthem, just so you can know a little bit about the spirit of who we are, which is that we're for the thinkers, the brave ones who welcome the messy and complex, who connect the dots where others only see chaos, and who craft brilliant and insightful solutions that laugh in the face of mediocrity. So if that feels right to you, uh, contact me and let's chat. All right, we're gonna start by talking a little bit about media theory. And my background is in media ecology, which is a, a type of media theory. It was started by Marsha McLuhan, the University of Toronto. And I just think it's so important to understand that within the context of communication today, in or out of the pandemic, but especially now. Um, if you, know, you are in the world and you are living and breathing, <laughs> You're probably aware that we're in the midst of a global pandemic that we have not seen the likes of in 100 years. And um, we really can't ignore that. Yet, interestingly, if you go to corporate websites, um, you, you can you see like people are kind of ignoring it. At full disclosure, I worked with four on four.com when I was at Razorfish for about a year and a half. Um, you know, they talked a little bit about it here. They could like kind of loosely allude to it. Um, you know, and great team, like this is not a comment on any company or any team, but, um, but it is a comment on, um, you know, like reality, I guess. <laughs> so um, I don't know why my screen, oh, it keeps going black. Dang, I guess I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening. Um, I'm going to, I will just zoom in and out here when I need to. Netflix, I know this is the Netflix acquisition page and they wanna get your email address, but don't you just want like the top 10 apocalypse movies or the top 10 documentaries on um, pandemics or I don't know, something like that? That's what I want. When That would make me sign up, I'm a Netflix user, but that would make me sign up. Interestingly, um, a lot of these companies are doing better in the social space. For some reason, it's like you can be real in the social space, social media but not on the corporate website. So that's another interesting thing I found when I was looking around. Um, here's just another example of Wayfair, which I thought, gosh, you know, like, wouldn't you want it, you know, we're stuck at home. Like, don't you want to like, you know, I don't know, buy new throw pillows or whatever. <laughs> this is such a great opportunity and yet really not addressed here. You know, everyone seems to have this like banner across the top that says a note on COVID-19, learn more. I just feel like, you know, and that, I'm sure that's like part legal um, or whoever, you know, wants to put that up there, but I just feel like we can do better. So that's my thesis tonight. We are at a point in society where we can speak to each other in um, just really candid ways. And if you miss this on Netflix in December, and this is a great example of how the social channel doesn't match other channels, but... Um, this was maybe the peak of post, post, post modernity in, you know, social media um, today. So, you know, what's something you can say during sex, but also when you manage a brand Twitter account? And there were all these brands interacting, having this conversation. If you missed it, 
please go back and Google it because it is hilarious. And it's, you know, you see these brand Twitter accounts um, trying to stay on brand with their message. I mean, it's so good. But this, so if this is where we're at, and I would suggest this is where we're at, then why do we kind of act so hierarchical and so um, kind of buttoned up in ways that don't make sense? And just as a um, as an aside, um, you know, my first job was as the first online community reporter at the Seattle Times in 1994. And my job was to report on the online community, but it was also to set up and moderate Usenet boards on a bulletin board system. I mean, <laughs> it was like forever ago. And one of my first tasks that I had to do is make up a list of a bunch of like swear words and inappropriate topics, um, you know, so that we could like program them in to be recognized and have some level of moderation. But, um, you know, we just, you know, we, we, we see this evolution, like this Netflix would have never flown 25 years ago, right? But like today, it feels funny, right? And kind of natural. So I think the question there, though, is like, how do you to strike the right tone. And, and I love this little uh, quote here, which says, my health and safety is the top priority of so many brands. I never even knew had my personal email address because, you know, how many emails have you received that have said, um, you know, we're here for you. That seems to be like the standard cop out copy. Um, and what I'm asking us to do tonight is think about how do we go beyond that? Like there's somewhere in between, you know, ignoring it completely and we're here for you. There's got to be other responses. And, and all of that is about, you know, having the right tone. All right. So we're going to start here. We're going to start with a little bit of media theory. And here's the, um, what, what media ecology suggests. It suggests that communication technologies are the key driver of social change. And when I say communication technologies, I do mean mobile phones, I mean the internet, but I also mean the alphabet. I mean things like the mirror and cars and trains, and we won't go there because that's like kind of the advanced version of this, but communication technologies, anything that moves a message in some sort of way are the key driver of social change. I personally believe that. I believe we would not have hashtag, um, you know, a Black Lives Matter movement, a Me Too movement without the internet today. And I do think it's not just a key driver of social change, but how the, the way we think. And I'm going to walk you through that. In media ecology, we believe there are three phases of communication. There's kind of like everything prior to the alphabet. So the tri our tribal communication, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail in a second. You know, that really when we were able to start really communicating with each other. Then around 3,000, 3,500 years ago, you see the introduction of the alphabet. Um, the alphabet, by the way, you know, it was a new technology. Socrates came out. He was <clears throat> very unhappy about it. He said that, you know, the, the um, symbols we use, the letters, will, will like suck us of our soul. Like we won't be able to remember who we are if we put our trust in these letters. So whenever you hear someone talking about how bad texting is or social media, like think of that, like every new technology has its, people resist, right? Because it's really frightening. It changes the way we think and we act. So that was literate communication. And then about 175 years ago when the um, telegraph was invented, it was the beginning of electronic or digital phase of communication. And when you think about the telegraph, think about how revolutionary it was to be able to send a message that was not dependent on time or space. I mean, it's literally blows everything else we have you know, out of today, out of the water. So I just want to go through this at a high level. Again, we're just going to breeze through this, but I want to give you a sense for it because I think it's really so important. And one of the things I love about media theory is it always really allows me to vet like the latest trend. And I feel like it gives me context to say like, is that going to be a really big thing or is it not? Because this, this is just based in, you know, really, um, deep theory. So we're going to talk about just quickly about tribal. So the way media ecology works is that a sense rules a communication phase, a type of thinking rules it, and relationships. So in the tribal um, phase of communication, it was ruled by the ear. And when you think about that, it was ruled by the ear because it was all based on speaking, right? There was no real way to record things. I mean, yes, you had cave drawings and whatnot. There were some of that, but there wasn't 
not a really um, a formalized and ubiquitous way to record things. And so it really was, you had to be around the campfire or at the tribal meeting or whatever that may be. Also people to find geography by sound. So if you could hear a bell or hear a horn blow, you were within that community. In fact, I just want you to take like 10 seconds. I just, we're gonna close our eyes just for a second. And I want you to listen to the sound in your space. And notice where it's coming from because it's not just coming from one direction. Sound hits us from all over, right? So that makes brings us to thought, which is we are cyclical thinkers when we are sound-based um, communicators. Um, you know, we think about things like cycles of the moon and um, uh, oceans, um, tides. People don't have, you know, in tribal communities typically have a specific age. They're an elder or a youth, right? So things are just less defined. They're more cyclical. And our relationship is community-based. When we go to literate and we introduce the alphabet, we become ruled by the eye, right? Because you need the eye to read and reading has a beginning, middle and end, regardless of the kind of alphabet. It is linear for the most part. And that's the kind of thinkers we became. And so when you look at the things that were invented within that time, even like, you know, you look at, for example, like uh, more ancient cities, you know, you, ancient cities are, built around some sort of spiritual center typically and built out in concentric circles in the literate like when we got you know here to the u.s we just laid down train tracks on a grid and then built against it right it's just a literate it's a different way of thinking and this was really focused on the individual which was good you know it's good and it's bad right so we removed from community but at the same time you know, we got to be individuals, we got to be individual thinkers, we science flourished, right? Um, people were able to step back from things that were assumed, maybe if they didn't agree with like a religion or a certain way of thought, they could be an individual. So there's goodness there too. Um, but it did take us away from that community base. Oh my gosh, you don't know what's happening with this. So, um, so we get to digital. And digital is ruled by the nervous system. And think about what the nervous system looks like against what um, the, uh, the internet notes look like, right? It's similar. And, you know, Marshall McLuhan globe the term, or, or the term, coined the term a global village, right? We really truly are in a global village. The thinking that we have is nonlinear today. It is this kind of hybrid, right? Because, um, you know, we are linear beings, but we're really so many ways nonlinear. The fact that, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but that we're just not, we're not time and space dependent as much as we used to be. Um, relationship wise, we talk about it as being reunified. And so as much as there's so much written about how the internet has torn us apart, I, don't, I actually personally do not believe that. I mean, you can have a different opinion, but I, I, I don't think the research is asking the right questions. You know, I just read an article about um, how we're not doing good media research. We're kind of, it's kind of like asking like, is food good or bad? It's like, is the internet good or bad? It's just too, it's too simple of a question to ask. Um, you know, we know for a fact that if you engage in social media, people feel positively about it, but if they're just passively reading the news on it, they don't necessarily feel good about it. So it's a lot about the way we use it as well. But the whole idea is that within a digital community, we are reunified. We are in communities and acting in a more communal way than we ever have um, since tribal times. And again, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and so on. It's just a different space. This, I think, I love using this slide with my clients, which is that um, this is maybe, I don't know, six months ago, Lizzo asked, put out to the community on Twitter, someone do a ballet routine to Truth Hurts. So you've got this like amazing, super pop relevant artist asking for a ballet, which is just so like conservative and hierarchical and structured. And people responded, not only did individuals respond and they were providing, you know, they were doing um, videos on TikTok. I mean, just, like, this is like, this is so relevant and current, right? This is that non-linear, no hierarchy, um, you know, messages coming from all over the place kind of way that we think today. Um, but also the um, ballet companies started, you know, saying we're going to do a whole ballet against this. We have, I had to get Obama in here just for old time's sake, but we have Obama, you know, slow jamming the news like a president and set aside, you know, 
what's happening now, but like, you know, historically presidents were very buttoned up, you know, and, and here we have Obama, very credible, very much a leader, but at the same time, slow jamming the news on the Tonight Show. Um, we have, you know, doing yoga in like a, a, you know, among art, like famous, you know, historical, you know, uh, very tied up art, right? So, so we've, we've reunified ourselves. Um, and the cool thing that Marshall McLuhan says, and I just love this, one of my favorite quotes from him, is that when we surpass writing, and let me just pause there before, because I know I'm talking to writers and content folks. When I say surpass writing, I don't mean writing's going away, but I do think that writing is changing. And um, there's more options than just writing. Now, granted, if we're doing, you know, um, uh, audio, we're doing video, there's often writing behind that as well, but there's just different, more options, right, than just, we don't rely just solely in writing. And so that's what Marshall McLuhan means there. And what he says is when we surpass writing and that way of thinking, we become super civilized and sub-primitive. Just like take a second and just soak that in. Super civilized and sub-primitive. It's mind blowing, I think. So I anyway, th keep thinking about that. The other thing, you know, I'll say just to the point about um, uh, surpassing writing is this is a great uh, quote from a New York Times article and talks about. In other words, we've been learning to write in ways like communicate our tone of voice, not just our mastery of rules. Right? Like we are getting. You know, dictionaries are like two hundred years old. Right? We deconstructed the alphabet already through texting. Um, you know, so we're learning C writing not as a way of asserting our intellectual superiority, but as a way of listening to one another better. Oh, so like beautiful. I've been learning to write not for power, but for love. Um, and then the other thing here is that Marshall McLuhan says, our new environment compels commitment and participation. We have become irrevocably involved with and responsible for each other. And I think this is the key piece here is that we live in a society, the way we communicate, the way we think, it compels commitment and participation. You can't watch airplanes, um, you know, crashing into uh, the World Trade Center and not feel a commitment and a participation. You can't watch doctors and nurses, you know, um, breaking down or sleeping in the halls of hospitals because they've been working, you know, for days on end um, and not feel commitment and participation. Um, this one, I'll just play this real quick. I don't know if you've seen it, but this is, um, this is the Italian singing in Siena during uh, lockdown. <laughs> So that's the idea, right? Is that we are, um, you know, through digital communication, we are able to connect in new ways. Um, I want to also share with you a little bit more, and then we're going to get into some examples, um, an idea that comes out of this, which is that we are now networked individuals, right? So we are individual, but we are within networks. And the idea of networked individualism, which is, again, so important because this is your audience. This is us, but this is who you're writing for, is that social ties are built upon the individual rather than predefined units that we're shifting away from hierarchical bureaucracies, okay? Um, and you can see there's some great um, talks out there. There's a great TED talk out there that talks about how trust is moving away from what we considered like the experts, you know, into kind of the everyday. Del Upton writes about the extraordinary of the everyday. The fact that we can, and I know people kind of hate this in some ways, but you can Instagram your lunch. That's beautiful. You know, it's like we are all publishers, right? So there's that shift away and trust um, movement away from that hierarchy. We shift to looser, fragmented, on-demand networks like this one. Prioritization of person over place, right? Who cares about place? We, we are not time and place dependent anymore, and that's amazing. And while they can be isolating, they're really more likely to be liberating because we get to define our own selves. This is a look, this is Barry Wellman at the University of Toronto, and I won't go through all these, but just a few, pick them out. You know, we're moving from neighborhoods to dispersed networks and from shared community to multiple partial personal networks. 
awesome, face-to-face -face to computer mediated, right? So w this is the movement. This is who you're writing for. This is your audience. Um, and then, you know, we see this coming out in, the, in how people relate to brands. So 90% of consumers more likely to trust a brand that supports social and environmental issues, right? It used to be that brands were very kind of separated from um, kind of personal or societal issues unless they like sponsored a charity in a very specific way. And that's not true anymore. There's like a demand for it. 61% of millennials expect a brand to stand for something. This is the hardest thing when I work with clients and who are more traditional because they're afraid to go here, but this is like where the goodness is. And then 56% of Gen Z considers themselves socially conscious. And summarize, you know, I think Q Internet says it well, which is that whatever language we use to describe it, the beating heart of the internet has always been its ability to leverage our social connections. And that's what I want to get across today is that we need to be human when we write. We can't just be this corporate you know, learn more about COVID-19, click here. I, I just, I find that to be odd in today's um, environment. Um, so with that in mind, I want to give you a very, it's a very light, <clears throat> very high level spectrum, if you will, for crisis communication. Um, and it's really built on that idea of commitment and participation that we just talked about, that idea that we are compelled to, to this today and the way we communicate. So the first thing I want you to think about is how during this time, and during any time, but especially right now, how do you acknowledge what's going on? You know, how do you be present in the world, you know, talk more about COVID-19 in more personal ways, and then acknowledge that impact, right? And beyond the like, we're here for you, right? Just like, make it real. Second, connect. Based on your brand's purpose and attributes, find ways to connect with human needs and develop content around those needs. So, you know, the tone obviously needs to map to your brand. Your brand personality is going to vary depending on who you are, um, but there is a way to do that. And I'm going to show you some examples. And then finally, serve. I've read, been reading a lot about how brands are moving to the service model, which is fascinating, right? So serving your customer, look for ways to serve your customer through an offering, involve the community in it if you can, and then of course, always tell stories. So let's look at a few examples and you can see I've kind of put a little bit of, kind of rated them down there at the bottom. But you know, you have these companies, you know, this is AT&T, um, you know, great picture. Um, you know, they have, you know, it's a family, so that's fantastic. You know, obviously, if you have a family right now, you're probably also all in the same room. I just banned my kids from using um, iPads between six and seven, so I had bandwidth tonight, you know. So, um, you know, we're keeping you connected, right? So that's a nice message. They've acknowledged it. Okay. Um, here's Toyota. Um, have done, you know, a job, better job maybe. Um, you know, be, being a little more personal, you know, I think the challenge here is, is this the right tone? How personal do you want to get if you're Toyota? My question would be, do they have those personal connections already? Is this how their brand usually acts? I've worked with Toyota a bunch, so that's why I question it. Not that they're not a personal brand, but, um, you know, the point I'm trying to get across is now's not the time to go from like, we're very formal to, Hey, let's have a heart to heart. So again, something to consider is like, you want to be consistent. Oh, I don't know why these are, they're flowing in wrong. Okay. Hang on. Um, Guys, I don't know if you can still hear me. We can hear you, uh, okay. but we're not seeing your screen anymore. Yeah, hang on. It's kind of, I'll just, um, uh, I'm getting the wheel of death. I don't know what's going on. Hang on, just give me a second here. I might need to, uh, oh, it's keynote. Okay. Let me see if I can reopen it. Apologies. Please hold. <laughs> All right. 
think we're back in action. Let's see. Okay, we're back in action. All right, hang on. Sorry about that. Okay, talked about Toyota. We're going to talk about um, uh, Getty Museum. I'm just going to leave it in. I'm having a little trouble with the keynote tonight, and I'm not sure why. So I'm just going to leave it in um, this mode, and hopefully you can see it okay. So Getty. So Getty, um, you know, I don't know if you've seen them do this, but they're putting out a challenge right now to dress up like works of art, which is like perfect. Like how perfect is that for right now? Um, we have, um, this is actually ExxonMobil who does a really lovely job with images and stories. Um, you know, it definitely is a little more press releasey, but they're doing a lot and they're talking about it and it's, and it's lovely. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have Fabletics, which obviously not an essential brand, although today, you know, everyone's trying to figure out how to, um, you know, get up and move around when you're stuck in a house and they've done a good job. They have, you know, they've done uh, two things they've done a good job on. One is it's a consistent message across channels. And I'm not seeing a lot of that right now regarding COVID. Um, also what I'd love here is they have their trainers and their athletes here. And then they have this promotion from Demi Lovato, which is, you know, percentage of, um, uh, of uh, sold items uh, will go to crucial gear for frontline workers. So that's lovely as well. Zoom. Zoom is trying really hard. I know it's had a lot of trouble lately and I think never expected to be like the most popular kid at the party um, so quickly. But, um, you know, some good stuff here about how to adapt to remote working. There's actually some really good videos. They do live trainings. A great way to serve, right? And I think that's the question is like, for whatever you do, how can you be of service, right? That is the tone that we need, ideally, in my opinion, to hit. Here's Gucci. This was Gucci a couple of weeks ago, not shockingly. And this is Gucci now, which is so interesting. And I've mixed feelings about kind of the extreme shift um, I do know there, I have some really good friends in Italy and they're like, all of our, our PPE is being made by Prada and Gucci right now, which is of course, cause it's Italy. But, um, you know, the fact that, you know, they are like really talking about it. I, I just, and it's Gucci. Like, I just love this. It feels human and real. Here's Nordstrom, another favorite. I'm going to point out a few things here. One is, if you get the Nordstrom email, they send this outfit of the day about once a week. And their outfit of the day, the most recent one, was like sweatpants, slippers, and scrunchies, which I just thought, like, bravo, right? They hit the right tone for their audience. It was appropriate. The other things that are lovely here is, you know, you have, like, at-home facials. You have, you know, they're, they're, it, what they've done is, and if there's anyone from Nordstrom on the call who's involved, um, with this, like seriously, bravo. Um, I love this woman who's going to work from home in her like, um, you know, evening gown, you know, and you know, it's light because not right. Nordstrom is light. It's kind of a really nice tone. And then they have this woman here who I just also adore because she's in her living room. She's an employee and she's leading a yoga class, a full yoga class. It's like a 25 minute class. Um, and what a great way to be of service. I've seen a couple of companies do this where they're offering some sort of meditation or yoga and just a really like, if, if it works for your brand, like if it's appropriate for your brand, that's where I think we can take that and we can say, what, what makes sense, right? Like what, how can we connect in a human way, be of service in a human way based on who we are as a brand? I stole this off of Paula's Facebook page, but um, this is Ikea, absolutely like stunning. It's simply, you know, one of their, you know, typical um, instructions, but it's a stay home promotion. And again, just like lovely. It's the right tone. Um, it's light and it's serious at the same time. It's a public good. It's of service, but it's done in a way that's on brand. And then I'll just end here with Starbucks. And again, if there's anyone on the call, really great job. These are just a few of the things. I love this chicken with each other. We'll get through this together. Starbucks is all about community. That's exactly what the brand is. So it makes sense um, to do that. And then this one, I just pulled this off of Facebook, which is um, different ways to take a coffee break. So, you know, when you think, all right, well, 
I mean, there are some Starbucks that are open, but if you can't get to Starbucks or if you went there every day, like, you know, I don't know when the last time was I had a Starbucks probably two weeks ago, but, um, you know, it was like, here's different ways. If you're missing company, here are things to do. If you're feeling restless, if you're feeling anxious, it just, you know, the whole point of this all is that we are at a place where this is not just okay for brands to talk in this personal way, but it's expected and it's welcomed. Um, and as long as, my opinion is as long as it maps to your brand, like it's true and authentic to your brand, then this is what we should be doing. So um, I'm just gonna run you through a quick case study. I'm just keeping an eye on time and then I'll open it up if, if we wanna chat about anything. So um, I am working right now with Save the Chimps. They're a client of ours. I've done a lot of work with them. I've done some workshops with them, some storyboards with them, some um, scripting and videos and whatnot. Um, they're a lovely organization. I've been to the Chimp Sanctuary twice. It is, like, it's really, it's, it's hard to explain. It's just so peaceful there. It's, like, just lovely. Like, you know, I've been driving, I've driven around on a golf court a car early in the morning and just hear the chimps. It's just a lovely, lovely place. Um, and they're doing their annual fund. And um, we were talking a couple of weeks ago because they're like, oh my gosh, how do we do an annual fund drive right now? That just seems like an impossible task. And what we did is we decided to make the entire thing run around COVID-19 because why not? That's what's happening right now in the world. To ignore that just seems like bizarre. So um, this is right now, um, make double the difference, your gift will be matched. They do this every year. They actually, it goes well for them, but we wanted to um, adjust the tone. Um, so I'm gonna show you just a couple examples here, um, just some high level examples. Um, this is literally happening right now. Um, and will be happening for the next three weeks. But one of the things we did just for, to create a framework at the start was to, we wanted to create an emotional journey. So this runs for four weeks um, and we wanted to be inspiring and hopeful. Also, we wanna make sure people really understand there's a real need here, especially now. Um, we wanna balance that with the fact that, you know, a lot of people have lost jobs. So how do you ask for money when, you know, how many people are unemployed right now, right? So all of that really complex messaging, right? A complex tone. So what we did is we came up with a journey. We're going to create empathy week one, deliver sanctuary, build community, and promote action. And that's our general guideline week to week. And that's what governs all of our messages. So we're doing emails, we're doing Facebook, and we're doing Instagram. Um, and they're color coded. Um, you know, these are you could see the pink is challenges. Um, this is kind of a lower emotional level. Um, we have some social media flash challenges. Um, we're doing a, we're launching tomorrow a nut drive <laughs> because I don't know if you know this, but chimpanzees love nuts and they also stay a long time so they can store them for a long time. Um, so we have flash drives here. Um, we have these stories of hope. So we don't want to keep everyone just like depressed the whole time, especially right now because it's already a really hard time. So we have these kind of stories of hope and then we have these rewards that we're giving. Um, and so you can see we're kind of, taking them through a journey without keeping them to, um, you know, we don't, you know, and maybe if things were perfect in the world, we could, we could really hone in on the like, Hey, it's really hard. We really need your help, but not right now. We need to balance that. So a couple of quick things here, when we look at the acknowledge, connect and serve, um, one, uh, thing that we're doing is, um, when we talk about acknowledge, the whole, like I said, the whole campaign is based on COVID-19. Every single post, uh, for the most part, let me just rephrase that, probably 80% of the posts are directly related. And then we have some chimp stories in there, but we're still connecting them. Um, from a connection standpoint, um, there's a couple of things that matter here. First of all, these chimps lived in isolation. Um, many of them, uh, some of them come from the astronaut program. Um, and some of them come from a um, testing facility in New Mexico. And then some of them come from like being pets or um, entertainment animals. And a lot of them have lived in cages. And we're really talking about that now. Like they know what it's like and they can actually help us. This brand and some of the brand work I'm doing with them is we're pivoting from like who's helping who? Like are we really helping them? Are, they, are we saving them? Or are they really saving us? And what does the trajectory of Save the Chimps look like, you know, over the next, you know, 
you know, over the next decades, because really, um, you know, if they do their job, they'll put themselves out of business and what purpose can they serve, you know, uh, around just animals and sanctuary. And so um, this whole idea that, you know, they've lived in isolation, they know what it's like, they can help us. Um, another thing is like we use and need PPE. I don't know if you saw, but Tigers of the Bronx Zoo tested positive for, for COVID. We know now chimps can get COVID. We're pretty sure about that. Um, and so, you know, there's all these rules in place uh, there as well. Um, how we stock staples during a pandemic. I mean, obviously, I've been to their kitchen. It's a very complex and it's, you know, doing, doing that now is even harder. And then messages of hope we're serving too. And then finally the service part, how are we serving? What are we giving back? So a couple of things there. One is, yes, you can make a donation today and we'll match you, but we're also offering people the ability to pledge and you can pledge and it will um, realize on July 14th, which is um, world chimpanzee day and part of that was we what our goal was less around money this year and it was more around um community participation and so that so you know there are people obviously so many people have been laid off or temporarily laid off that are like i want to give but i can't right now so this offered them an opportunity it was really a service for them also, one of the things we're going to do later in this is we're going to allow the ability to participate for a match. So, for example, and especially with kids home and homeschooling, maybe, you know, you color in a picture of a chimpanzee and we'll match you. We'll give $10 or whatever, $20 from our matching fund, even though you're not giving money, right? So, again, it was really focused on community participation as a service rather than, like, you know, we're going to hone down every dollar, um, the ability to leave a message. So we're going to have an opportunity here in the coming weeks to leave messages for the chimps and for the staff and have a board um, online to do that. Sanctuary sounds we're working on this week, um, kind of like a meditation, but you can listen to the chimps. And ideally, uh, a chimp chorus, if we can pull that off. I don't know if you've seen, you've probably seen a lot of the um, uh, chimp chorus or the choruses online. Um, and so we're going to try to do something like that. We'll see how, how well we can pull that off. Here are some examples of content. This is, again, you know, um, talking about um, the launch. Um, and then here's our um, Instagram post here as well. Um, this is cut. These are all screenshots from a video we just made. And um, it's a really, it's actually a fun video considering it's kind of a heavy topic. But you, know, you can see the staff, they get their temperature taken twice a day they're on like this skeleton staff crew they have to keep six feet between people and chimps um you know and they have all this ppe they have to wash all the vegetables which they have you know tons and tons of stuff so anyway so that's what we're doing that's what we're trying to do we're really trying to um connect and really hit it head on like we are going to actually address this it makes total sense so last slide here i'll finish up um and then if, if we want to discuss anything, I would love to do that. So key takeaways. One, when you're looking at this and you're looking at that framework, I really want you to think about how you can show commitment and participation. That's where we are right now in the world, how we communicate, how we think. And I want you to think about what that means for your brand or your organization. Look for ways to serve. Like how can your brand or organization, what can they do? And it might just be make someone laugh. It might be, you know, give someone a little bit of peace today, right? It doesn't have to be that you're making masks or you're, you know, making ventilators. Um, you know, that may not be appropriate, obviously, for your organization, but what can you do that, that pro provides some solace during these times? So tell stories always, obviously, you know this, your content folks, so tell stories and go beyond writing. Like, let's surpass writing here. Like, yes, let's do writing, but let's surpass it and be, sub primitive and super civilized. And to, and finally, and this is kind of like a, um, a nitpicky one of mine, it's like push for consistency across channels. I know you're not always in charge of that. You may be on the social account or the website account or the app account and everyone doesn't talk to each other, but if you can really try, because I think that there's, there's, there's always some inconsistency, but right now I think it's so important to be unified in that way. So um, I, I'm going to open up for questions. Thanks for listening to me um, talk about media theory. I hope I didn't put anyone to sleep. And I'm also just going to leave this here in case anyone wants to email me or find um, us on Instagram or Facebook. So.
Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That's awesome. Uh, so we've had some really interesting um, questions and just kind of discussion points coming up in the in the chat. So Larry's going to kind of um, queue some of those up, but I think I might go ahead and unmute people. So if if uh, we don't have so that we can let an actual discussion happen and not just uh, not just have to kind of respond um, that way. So let me do that now. But Larry, if you wanted to kind of queue some stuff up. Yeah, thanks, Laura. That was great. Um, really appreciate it. One, one question that came up a couple times. Um, <clears throat> someone asked if you could repeat those three mining points on the early slide. Uh, I, think, I think we had a little technical issue right around then, and a couple people missed those. Yeah. And so, but I'm sorry, just to, just to, I did just unmute people, but maybe stay. Uh, you can mute or unmute yourselves, too. So maybe stay, uh, re-mute yourself unless you, unless you want to speak so we can still kind of manage sound thanks absolutely do you mean the three what i think it was early, in fact i may have grabbed i think it was the pretty early on um slide 31 was the 31. the question was about slide 31 there were three oh points. yes yep yep spectrum of commitment and participation yeah here let me pull that up hang on so the idea here was um you know, like one, let's not ignore the fact that we're in the midst of a global pandemic. And then, you know, at the very begin, at the very least, if you do nothing else, acknowledge that it's going on, try to do a little better than the little, um, read more about our response. You know, if you can just take it a little further. And then if we, if you can go beyond that, really try to connect based on your brand's attributes and, and value prop. And then if you can go beyond that, look for ways to serve your customers or your donors. Great. Thanks. And then we had two questions. Uh, Carrie had a question and then Liz um, had a follow on to it. I'll just read both of them because uh, I think this is a super interesting point. Um, first from Carrie, when you make a decision to go all in to highlight the work from home experience, you're excluding the essential workers who have a very different reality. Uh, for companies who serve many different audiences, how do you acknowledge the situation without alienating or offending? And I'll go ahead and read Liz's question too because they kind of go together. Yeah. Um, she said yeah, similar thoughts as Carrie. She's, um, she's struggling with the fact that a lot of this messaging isn't inclusive or is overly casual when the humans on the other end of the message are in a high stress moment. It also feels icky to capitalize on a global pandemic. Super easy for this to lead to brand blowback, which is why I think so many brands are being conservative. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I find I find it icky that they're being so conservative. I just find that so not appropriate for today's way of communication. Um, I'll, yes, a lot of examples I showed you were light. I mean, obviously, if you are, um, you know, I mean, so here, here's what I always ask. And I've been working in social media for 25 years. I have a master's degree with a focus in social media. Um, you know, I've studied this quite a lot. I was a social media SME for Razorfish for years. I always feel like, what, what authentically can your brand talk about, right? So like, if you're Starbucks, you know, you have the right, at least with me as a consumer, to talk about like, hey, how's your day going? What's your break like today? You know, um, or if you're Nordstrom, like, you know, hey, relax and meditate, right? But you don't really have a right to talk to me about, right? I mean, this is my opinion, about, um, uh, you know, uh, scientific <laughs> information, right? And so, I think there are ways, and there were some examples in there that really did, I feel like, honor, um, you know, the scientific piece, ExxonMobil, who's doing real work, right? And like, you know, they're, I had GM in there, I took it out, but they're building ventilators, right? So I think it really depends on who your brand is. But I don't think being conservative does anything for anyone. I, I feel like it's cowardice, to be quite honest. Um, I think you have to figure out who your audience is and how to honor them. Now, if you're worried about you know, essentially, you know, obviously there's, you're going to have multiple audiences. Um, you know, if you want to be a tribute to essential workers, you know, maybe, um, and which a lot of brands have done, right. A tribute to doctors and nurses. I think there's a way to blend heavy and light. Um, and that was that last, um, one of those last slides where it shows that journey. The other thing I'll just say is that I, I don't feel like it's capitalizing on a global pandemic. I feel like you have to act like you are a, a, a alive in this world. So I don't quite, you know, I'm happy to follow up on that question, but I don't see how it's capitalizing on it. 
Great. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, that's a tricky line. I, I totally appreciate you walking that. Yeah. Um, the other, Paula had a question. I'm curious, um, going back pretty early in the presentation, the Netflix example you gave, uh, Paula's wondering, curious as to whether you think that they could message, uh, that they could message that, uh, if you think that they can have a message that they can help people entertain themselves through this, or would that come off as inappropriate? I think rather than having a curated list of pandemic movies to have, um, I don't know, the kitten movie fest or something like that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I need the same. Oh, go ahead, Paula. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I think it's kind of the same question you just you just answered, which is, you know, kind of where's that line between, especially given, you know, Netflix and chill, right? You know, people are used to kind of already kind of have this idea of like, you know, Netflix being this, um, you know, stay at home, you know, you know, this way to sort of just right. entertain yourself, right? And now, I mean, they must be, I mean, I have to guess that they're doing fabulously, right? And so, you know, is it, that is kind of, so it's kind of the same question. It's like, would it be appropriate for them to acknowledge that? Or, or as you suggested, which I think, which is fabulous too, I think, which is just to sort of, without, without you even asking it to sort of, you know, have here are some you know, here's some programming suggestions, you know, versus sort of overtly messaging, hey, where are your way to pass time since you're stuck in the house? I mean, I personally, my opinion, and by the way, Netflix does have this lovely um, feature right now. It's a, a series of um, celebrities who are talking about um, impact of, um, of COVID and whatnot. So they're doing some con like actual content around this. Again, I feel like if that is your brand and you've worked to develop that as your brand, why wouldn't you message that? I just feel like sometimes we're too, we're too, um, I don't know, like, why are we afraid to say, like, you're at home. We know you're, we know that, like, 90% of the earth is stuck at home. Granted, we also know, you know, maybe another way Netflix could say that is there's people who don't have homes and we're going to put some of this towards a, um, a fund or I don't, whatever. But I think for those people who know Netflix, like you're at home, why I don't understand why you wouldn't. Um, that is your value prop is to entertain people. And right now that I think is a huge, huge opportunity because, you know, either so was it Samantha B who said last night, she said, I turn my days are short. I turn on CNN right when I get up and then it's midnight. It's like, you know, we're like just in this overconsumption mode and it's like, maybe they're offering some, some peace and levity. So that's my take. Just my own view. Hey, Laura would like you to do some prognosticating. Uh, she asks, uh, how, how do you think things will be after we're out of isolation? That is what, which of these technologies and tools that we're using to stay connected and educated during the quarantine you think will be adopted long term? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think my hope, because I've been an advocate for work from home for 20 years, um, I, um, I am a huge fan of all things digital. Um, I hope that we do more work from home. My company, we are 95% remote. My teams work you know, they're always remote. We were, we have co-working space at the Riveter. We meet there maybe twice a month. Um, so I do hope that things like Zoom or Teams or whatever tool you use to do remote meetings will continue. I think there's a lot of room for improvement in some of these tools that um, are being highlighted right now. So I think that's true. I just, there's a great little startup here in Seattle who is launching, um, I want to call, I think it's called Boodle. It's um, old razor fish folks. Um, and it is like a TikTok for the workplace. And um, <laughs> which basically is more just like you get off of a meeting and you're like, okay, I just want to like, you know, it's just like a, a summary. It's not necessarily like dancing and singing, although I guess you could do that too. So that'll be interesting. I think, you know, how do we blend? I think, you know, with and media theory states that all these walls are dropping. And if you look at the most modern, you know, companies right now, when you walk in, right, you're not walking into an office, you're walking into a living room, right? I mean, we work at a coffee shop. So I think that'll be interesting. Like how, what are those technologies that help work be more, um, a little faster, more, you know, um, the paddly thing. Can you guys mute? Sorry. I thought you were asking. 
<laughs> thought you were jumping in. Um, anyway, so that so that's what I think will be really interesting. And I think anything that's like authentic, like that authentically connects ourselves. I never thought like QR codes were going to like change the world, you know, like it's really got to be, you know, Genevieve Bell, who was at Intel for years, she's a professor in Australia and she talks about how, um, you know, the only technologies that really upset us are the ones that um, mess with our uh, concepts of time, space, or human relationships. It's why, like, no one freaked out about the fax machine. No one was like, oh, my God, people are faxing all the time. It's going to ruin us, right? But, like, when kids started texting, it was like the world was ending, right, which never happened. So those, I think, will be, like, what can better connect us and digitally? And I will say, and just one other thing here is that I know we love meeting in person. I'll tell you. I'm a mom of a couple of kids. The second I started having kids, I did a lot less in-person meetings. I have a son who has autism. He does not do well in crowds. They're really overwhelming. There was a great meme recently that I saw in the disability community. And I do think that digital is an evening uh, leveling space and that meeting in person is um, a privilege that I don't think we see it. So we can say, oh yeah, this is a community and it's not community unless we're face to face, but you have to ask yourself who's not there who's not in your personal community because they're not privileged to be there. Um, and so the fact that like yesterday, Microsoft said, we're going to do all of our events online through 2021 or summer of 2021. I think those are the technologies that you're going to see um, us using. So. Wow. That's um, interesting. Yeah. Um, hey, and Katie had a, is another interesting take on this. She, she asks, if your organization's way of serving is to just keep the service running for customers, is there a message for that in this time, or is silence more powerful at this stage of the game? What, and so when you say a service... Well, I'm gonna, I think that's Katie Hoshin, who works at Google. <laughs> and, oh, and so yeah. I'm wondering, if you're running like the world's biggest search engine, right, right. Do, you say, do, you, do you say anything about this, or do you just business as usual? You just deliver the search results? Um... You know, I think there's ways. I haven't looked at Google yet. Do you guys have an image around this? I'm sure you do. Yes. I mean, I've Google been... has been something about COVID or yeah. thanking the providers so or something the last few days. Yeah. Right. So that's what I would. That's what I would go to. And I, um, you know, I think something like that is appropriate. Again, it's that acknowledge and connect, and that's how Google connects with us is through. Yeah, and my question was a bit more specifically, like let's say an org within Google. Yeah, um, that is, you know, it's it's some little doing a service for folks, and you know we're working hard to make sure that service continues. But reaching out and you know connecting isn't really the way we normally communicate. So I'm just wondering if, you know, just not commute if there is a power in not communicating, or if that's really missing an opportunity. Um, I think I'd, I mean, I'd want to know more about the kind of service here, if it's, if it's behind the scenes service, um, you know, I guess I would question like, what would be, is there an assurance there? Is there uh, would, would your customers, right? Cause obviously content's always customer facing. Would they be concerned that for some reason your service would be down or it's not, I think that's where I would go. Like what, what makes sense to acknowledge in that? Um, because I don't believe in the, like, we're here for you. I, I think that's just not a great way to go. Um, it's gotta be more specific. So I would like the, what I would be writing on is like, we're here for you in what ways and does that make sense? And is it a, you know, maybe it's more simple, you know, email or something like that. Um, but I do think, we are in the midst of a global pandemic that we haven't seen the likes of in a hundred years. I think that gives us a reason to, and kind of a, it compels commitment and participation. So I would just, that, that's why it's like, I can't answer for every brand, but that's what I would say is look at acknowledge, connect, serve what, what's possible there. And, and it might be just laddering up to the overall, all of Google brand in that case. Thanks. Hey, we had a few questions from folks in the healthcare and medical space. Um, the first one, uh, Colin asked, in the healthcare space, our audience has experienced a crisis in deeply emotional and often terrifying ways. Is there, do you have any advice on striking a tone of support and stability, stability, remaining positive and hopeful while being real, authentic, and human yeah. in the traditional corporate voice? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I looked at a bunch of healthcare companies, and what I saw was not great in that, in the, this one specific area. It wasn't that they weren't trying to put a message out, it's that, and I don't know what kind of healthcare. 
uh, organization you're with, but I looked at Walgreens and CVS and Premira and all the, and they, there was some lovely messaging. This is more in social. Um, and all the comments were really upset people. And I think, and, and no response from the brand in those cases, the ones that I looked at and I may have been missing something. Um, but I think step one in that case is make sure you're acknowledging your customers because people obviously, you know, are incredibly stressed right now. Um, rightly so, um, especially around healthcare and, and um, all of that. So one, I would say, you know, get really solid in that response because those were, uh, I've not seen the likes of that in a long time. Um, those kind of levels are so at least the ones I've looked at. I think the other thing is, um, you know, I do think obviously you're going to have a more serious tone if you're a healthcare, if you're in healthcare right now, right? Like it's easy for Nordstrom to be like, we're going to have a yoga class. It makes total sense for them, right? It's easy for Starbucks to say, you know, um, here's how to have a coffee break. And that's what they should be doing. But if you're a healthcare provider, I'd, I'd really be more curious in understanding what you're doing, what you know, is there data you can share? Is there an infographic? Is there ways that you can offer um, guidance, you know, healthy guidance or, you know, whatever that may be. Um, again, I need to know the brand more to, to be more specific, but that I, I do think, again, how do you commit and how do you participate with your customers? That would be what I would ask. We had one follow on in that regard too. Um, I don't know their first name, A. Varyu asked, uh, said that uh, I work for a medical organization and we posted pics of our frontline staff running drive through COVID testing. We got about 90% overwhelming love and a strong 10% picking apart our PPE and why it wasn't as extensive as pics they'd seen from Europe, et cetera. We've also had blowback for a lack of clarity um, around whether testing has a, has a cost or would be free, uh, questions that have been unclear. I guess you're kind of wading into a lot of water as you do anything, right? Or but, but the, well, I guess that's the question is like, do you want to have a conversation with your customers or do you not? Like, yes, the safe way is to be like, like here for more information on COVID-19, but are you connecting? And I don't mean connecting from a capitalization standpoint. I don't mean like, and by the service, like that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we are at a point in our communication, it, this is my opinion, in media ecology theory, we live right now in a more broken, uh, when I say broken down, like hierarchical broken down. Like we are humans, we are real, we are connected. There's, you know, the user experience is here for a reason. Like we are compelled to, to participate. This is again, just my opinion, if that's the case, why wouldn't you, you you communicate during this incredible crisis? Now, in that case, I mean, I love that you got 90% of love. We all know it's the internet. You're going to get some pissed off people because that's what it is. And also because, yes, this is a super, I mean, we're all stressed out right now. So you're going to get that. I think, you know, around some of those questions, um, you know, if you don't have answers, like, can you talk about that? You know, and I know there's also legal and I'm sure that, you know, stuff's got to go through legal and you got pushback and all that, but what can you say? How do you be really authentic and create that, that real dialogue is what, is what I would ask. Mm -hmm. Actually, he followed up and said, um, I've been in charge of social media responses, kind of what you were just saying and responding clearly and quickly has been better than waiting, staying silent our patients are wanting, needing us to be proactive. Yeah, I totally. And that's been my experience, you know, even just, uh, hey, we're working on that. Or, I mean, people get mad, right? And especially now they're very stressed out. So um, it, it really, you know, when I'm looking at some of these brands and they've got this lovely image and like, hey, we're here for you and here's what we're doing. And then there's like 20 people saying like, you haven't come back to me. I can't get through. Blah, 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 blah. I was at your pharmacy and there was, everyone was crowded blah, blah. and no reaction. You've just like, why bother doing that content? Cause you've, you've almost created worse, but I also don't think you can ignore that. You have to acknowledge it. I, again, my opinion. Kind of again in the healthcare world, um, somebody shared and, and folks can jump into the, um, the, the chat and, uh, see the link uh, to the Aetna has a page up with, um, uh, just a number of reasons. I haven't had a chance to look through it, but it, it's, uh, it looks like a full page just with sort of member uh, links for members to various COVID-19 resources and uh, resources for 
employers, providers, uh, everybody in their network. So that was interesting. Yeah. I would say the and, other thing is, you know, what comes up for me is governance. And, you know, having worked in certain organizations, like I've worked with Alaska Airlines and social and, you know, um, and if we have anyone on the line, this was years ago, so it might have changed. But like, we had all the messaging where it was like, all right, what happens if a plane crashes? Like, you have to do that ahead of time. And granted, no one knew there was going to be a pandemic, but if you're caught now without that governance, that now is the time to figure out, like, what are the, what are the big questions? And then what are our response? Because we're not, like, on the fly, because that's a hard job to be on the fly trying to respond to upset people in social media. I've been there. Hey, I want to back up to you. Uh, Laura had had a, uh, the other Laura had had a second question um, that's kind of related to what we've just been talking about. She asked about with the shift away from hierarchical bureaucracies can be a real challenge uh, in science and public health. Um, and she's wondering how could how government, science, public health, uh, how they could a approach communication differently. I, I think she's kind of getting at some of the constraints that you have in a bigger bureaucratic organization and maybe nimbleness. Uh, Laura, if you want to chime in. Um. Yeah, I think there was a slide about like the diffusion of trust and that's great and a, a nice thing about digital and social media, but then the challenge with like say COVID-19 is when you diffuse that trust away from science and public health to anybody, um, how do you rein that back in? Like how do you as a as a government organization, so definitely not a brand. I mean, it's a brand, but a different type of brand. But, um, yeah. I guess counter that. Yeah, totally. That's a really great question. And I think that's a super valid point because obviously you don't want to go to your neighbor's sister's cousin to get like, what's the best advice I need for, you know, I have a cough and a fever, right? Like, that's not what we want to do. So I get it, right? And I'm sure we're all guilty of Googling, you know, I apologize to my doctor, because I'm like, I've Googled this, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to die in 48 hours. So um, yeah, totally. So I think that, you know, is about um, being out there as much as you can being, you know, obviously, you're a credible source you know, making that content consumable and pushing it. Because again, it's like you're countering, I mean, it's almost like a media buy, right? Like you're countering all this other chatter. So you've got to be out there. I wonder too, if there's ways, and I mean, I'm just throwing stuff out without knowing anything. So this may not be valid, but like, are there ways to bring in and create community ambassadors, like either local doctors or yeah, I don't know, or even trusted um, community organizers or something who can carry that message for you. So those folks who do have the trust, if you will, I mean, and not that, and I don't mean that like people don't trust valid, credible organizations. It's just that, right. It's not just like we look towards like you're, you know, the guru, um, health is maybe a little different in there, but how do you, how do you engage your community to amplify your message? Possibly. Easier said. No, oh, sorry. I want to kind of jump in on that because I think, you know, there, there are a couple of things here. One is, you know, kind of engaging and, you know, having a conversation with your community. And then there is, you know, are there ways you can serve the community from a content perspective? So as, as some of you know, I work for NASA and you would not think necessarily that there's a lot that NASA would have to say about COVID. Um, but I work for the Earth Science Division, which does uh, Earth Science research and, and um, data gathering. Um, and so there is an effort going on right now to, um, you know, to kind of see, you know, what what data does NASA have that could be, you know, relevant to doing, you know, research about things like how disease spreads and. And you know, I don't, I, I don't want to give anything away because, and I actually don't really know yet. But you know, I just can tell you that that's one way that an organization could maybe look and see, you know, is there anything, you know, that we could do to kind of help the world or help the community or you know, help however large that community is, whether it's, you know, just your, you know, your customers if you're a small business or if you know, customers if you're an agency, you know, how could we, you know what can we gather together from, you know, the resources we have that could help kind of, you know, solve the problem, right? Oh, so totally. doing that, you know, then you get some incredible, I mean, I hate to say sort of brand equity, but I mean, that you know, there's a good, you know. I mean, and, 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 and Paul, I love that. And two, two quick things. One is that 
like, you know, the, the capitalization of the brand equity. It's like NASA is an amazing institution. It's like, you know, I, I don't think that's a bad thing, right? Like we want to connect with people. I want to know what NASA is doing. I also will say this. There's, I don't even know the number, millions of children being homeschooled right now, homeschooled right now. Um, like give me all of your science <laughs> poster, whatever. I will whatever. send you, there are lots and lots <laughs> <Yeah>. of things. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, right. Like, uh, and I even like Fort Laura with healthcare, like, are there things you could do? My kids, te- uh, there's a platform called outschool.com and they take classes on that and they have a ton of classes on, um, pandemics right now. And kids are really, you know, interested. They want to know more. Um, you know, so that might be another area. It's like, really look around, like, what does the community around you need? And to that point, Paul, I think that's a good, like, you know, you have scientists and you have, you know, and then there's also parents and NASA is such a great source for teaching. So, you know, different ways to serve the community. Yeah. That's, that's kind of a, even aside from directly addressing, you know, the, the pandemic, there is a huge, and there's a huge kind of set of resources that has been, um, kind of gathered and centralized for parents who suddenly have to homeschool their children. And like, here's all these cool STEM activities from NASA and, you know, demos you can watch and, and, you know, games you can play and, you know, little things you can do to, you know, note, you know, clouds and, and count birds and stuff like that. You know, I mean, there's just a ton of stuff like that. And, you know, for people who are suddenly like, how do I keep these kids busy? All day? <laughs> That's a huge, <laughs> service. I mean, huge, huge service right now, let me tell you. Hey, Paul, do you think we have time for one more question? Uh, it's up to Laura, but let's maybe, I'm yeah, let's maybe do one okay. more and then we can kind of wrap up. Okay, great. Uh, there was a JBMS, um, or more of a comment, um, says that environmental conservation organizations are capitalizing on the fact that wildlife habitats need to be protected to stop or uh, the virus before it leaves the wild. Um, and, and then talks about that um, having a strong fundraising call to action uh, that's relevant that, to, to kind of go along with that message. What, what do you, any thoughts on that? And maybe I'm not, I'm not tracking the exact question. So thoughts on how to position. Well, I think it, and maybe it's, it's a little bit more of a comment that, but basically that some, uh, because, and I think this might go back to the fact that there's the theory is that this is an animal um, or origin, this is of an animal origin, that might be part of this, I'm not sure. But basically the fact that they're taking the opportunity to to talk about the fact that um, wildlife habitat needs to be protected yeah. to stop or to um, the, the, this, this. And then kind of pairing that with a, a strong call to action, you know, like, hey, uh, yeah, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I I mean, I am of the the thought that if you have, that, that every brand organization, whatever you want to call it, should have a point of view. And we are in a place where we can have these conversations. And um, I'm not maybe just personally someone who like is quiet and doesn't have an opinion and that's good or bad, whatever. But um, point being is that I do think like you're, you're going to, you know, there's kind of what it, there's, you know, like it's kind of like there are people who will disagree with you and not like you. Those aren't your people. All I would say is figure out who your people are, which I'm sure you guys all know because you're content experts and that's what we do. And then speak to those people, speak to them in a way that's authentic, that's real, that acknowledges the insanity of what is happening right now. And then somehow serves them through information, through solace, through making someone laugh through resources, whatever it is, like that's how we connect. And it's not necessarily about like making a sale or, or like building your brand up. I don't mean it like that. I just mean like there's goodness in connecting. And if you're an organization in the world, why be here if you don't have, you know, something to offer? And so, so connect around that. What a wonderful note to end on. <laughs> um, thank you, Laura. And thank you all for, uh, for being here and uh, for putting up with this, this new way of communicating. Um, we will be, uh, we will probably be doing at least one more this way. So, and, and uh, if we don't have it all worked out yet, but you may be interested that our next one um, we're working on is about accessibility. And so I think there's actually gonna be a lot of, um, kind of a lot of overlap in thinking about, you know, how we can help reach people. Um, 
help using you know digital communication and and um, addressing accessibility challenges and and all the new accessibility challenges everyone is facing. Um, reminder too, if you are not um, in our Slack channel, please uh, please join us. We'd love to see you there. It's a good way to just kind of keep the conversation going. Thank you for your questions and chats uh, or comments. Um, we will be, like I said, this is we, I've been recording this, so we'll make this available. And uh, we will um, be back in touch when we have a next when we have our next uh, our next event planned sometime in May. So thank you and good night. Thanks, Thank Thanks, everyone. Thanks everybody. Take care. Great talk.